But can we have evolution or biology as a basis for objective morality? Of course you can't. Because what does evolution say? It says that we're accidental byproducts of a long evolutionary process. Our morality has evolved like your toenail, or your teeth, or your ears. And it's ephemeral. It's without true meaning. Because the nature of biology and evolution is something that is an accident and is something that's ever evolved, evolving. Therefore, it cannot be objective. This is why the professor of science, Michael Ruse of the University of Guelph, he says, morality is a biological adaption no less than our hands, feet, and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when someone says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they're referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction. Any deeper meaning is illusory. This is why Richard Dawkins in his books, he actually is quite honest and frank about his worldview. And he says, there is no right, there is no wrong. There is no good and there is no bad. Because the basis of it is just biology, it's just matter. And I would argue, if it's matter, then it doesn't really matter. Now, can social pressures be a basis for objective morality? Of course not. Because what do social pressures mean? It means that the ever-changing influences of particular societies would influence our morality, our ethics. This is why we have the concept of modernity, which basically means don't be too attached to your values, by the way, because in a couple of years, they're bound to change. This is the concept of modernity in a very crude way, but this is what it is. Similarly, if we were to take the implications of saying that social pressure is a basis for our morality, then that would justify killing 6 million Jews in the 1940s. But we know this is objectively morally wrong. But to take social pressure as the basis for morality, that would mean killing 6 million Jews or any form of genocide is okay. So since biology and since social pressures ever change, then morality cannot be pegged on those things because it will turn to be subjective. Now, how does this mean that God exists? Well, it's very simple. Take the following summary. One, if God does not exist, objective morals do not exist. Two, objective morals do exist. Three, therefore God exists. Now this is aptly summarized by the eminent ethicist Richard Taylor. He says, the modern age, more or less, repudiating the idea of a divine lawgiver, has nevertheless tried to retain the ideas of moral right and moral wrong, without noticing that in casting God aside, they have also abolished the meaningfulness of right and wrong as well. My third argument is that God makes sense of the inimitability of the Qur'an. Now the argument here is that the Qur'an, due to its inimitability, which basically means you cannot emulate its structural features with regards to its language, is a miracle. And if this can be proven, then it proves the existence of a supernatural power. Because the Qur'an, which I'm going to argue, can only be best explained supernaturally, not naturalistically. Now, before we attempt even to do this, we have to find out if miracles are actually coherent. Do they really exist? Well, typically, atheists such as David Hume, they said a miracle is a violation of natural law. But I believe this description is a very ironclad description of what a miracle should be. It's a very descriptive, rigid view. Because what are natural laws? Natural laws brothers and sisters and friends, are just patterns we perceive in the universe. But if something breaks that pattern, does it mean it's a miracle? Of course not, because that could basically mean that it was an exception, or maybe we weren't looking hard enough, or maybe we didn't understand what the pattern was in the first place. 
So it's a very ironclad description of what miracles actually are. Now I would argue that the coherent definition of a miracle, simply put, is an act of impossibility. But as many philosophers have said, it's an event which lies outside the productive capacity of nature. Now let me explain this with regards to the Qur'an. Now it is well known from a Western academic and Eastern academic consensus perspective that the Qur'an is a unique piece of literature. Because the Qur'an, as we know, challenges mankind. In the second chapter, verse 23, the Qur'an says, and I'll say the Arabic and translate, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبِ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ أَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you're in doubt, talking to the doubters, the humanists, the secularists, the atheists, those who don't know, those who want to know, everybody, if you're in doubt about the book we have sent down to our servant, referring to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, then bring one chapter like it and call on your witnesses and your supporters and helpers besides God if you are truthful. So it challenges them. And we know from the exegetes, the mufassirun in Arabic, which basically means those who explain the Qur'an, this has something to do with the special nature, feature, style of the Qur'anic discourse. For example, even famous Arabists such as Arthur J. Arbery, he says, for the Qur'an is neither prose nor poetry, but a unique fusion of both. Similarly, Bruce Lawrence of Duke University in his book, The Qur'an, A Biography, he says, Quranic verses as tangible signs are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. Even the Reverend R. Bosworth Smith in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism, what does he say? He says, the Quran is a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth. It is one miracle claimed by Muhammad and indeed a miracle it is. A Dutch Orientalist, Martin Zamet, he also says the Quran is the most written, the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. And significantly, Professor and Arabist Hamilton Gibb, he says the Meccans, referring to the people at the time of Revelation 1400 years ago, he says the Meccans still demanded of him a miracle, referring to the Prophet Muhammad here, and with remarkable boldness and self-confidence, Muhammad appealed as a supreme confirmation of his mission to the Qur'an itself. Like all Arabs, they were connoisseurs of language and rhetoric. Well then, he continues, if the Qur'an were his own composition, other men could rival it. Let them produce ten verses like it. And if they could not, and it is obvious that they could not, let them accept the Qur'an as an outstanding evidential miracle. Now, so since the Qur'an cannot be emulated, then we can easily apply the definition of miracle to the Qur'an itself. Let's go back to the, def the definition. The Qur'an is a book. And the definition of a miracle is an event which lies outside the productive capacity of nature. So the Qur'an is a book, it's the event. The nature of this event, which is the Qur'an, is the Arabic language. When we go to the Arabic language and we exhaust all possibilities, combining the 28 letters, the finite grammatical rules, all the linguistic structures, all the words and letters, we exhaust the possibilities. We cannot create the structural features of the Qur'an. So think about this. Therefore the Qur'an is an act of impossibility. Or, in the longer definition, it's an event that lies outside the productive capacity of the Arabic language, which is its nature. So let's talk about this again. Qur'an on one side, which is an event. The nature of this event is the Arabic language. We go to the Arabic language, we exhaust all possibilities, but we can't create the event. But when we go back to the event, we know it's part of the nature, which is the Arabic language. When we go back to the Arabic language, we exhaust possibilities, we can't create the event. So we can't have a naturalistic explanation. It requires us to have a supernatural explanation, and God makes sense of this. So, let's summarize the argument. One, a miracle is an event which lies outside the productive capacity of nature. Two, the Qur'an's unique literary form lies outside the productive capacity of the nature of the Arabic language. Three, therefore the Qur'an is a miracle which proves the existence of a supernatural cognitive power which is best explained by God. Now my final argument is that God makes sense of the fine-tuning of the universe